the nightmare scenario is being content, living in a, a home with a wife you don't love and a house you don't want with, you know, that type of lifestyle versus just going after your dreams and failing. That's, that's exciting. That's, that's a purpose. What's up, guys? Jeff's talking shit about this protein <laughs> shake, but uh, we have on today Jake Kassam from Movement, and uh, I've known Jake actually October second, twenty sixteen. Oh, I did a, did a quick little uh, email check, and uh, I did my four minutes of due diligence. And for the last couple of years uh, on Instagram, I was always I always see in your profile twenty six years young, twenty seven years young, twenty eight years young, and I'm like, wow, this guy's like kind of ahead of the game. And in my four minutes of googling. I found out you started way earlier than everybody else. And you had, you know, the little bullshit hustles in the beginning, but what I found interesting was the car collateral. So um, let's just talk about just, first tell everybody who you are, and let's just talk about you growing up, uh, strictly from an entrepreneur perspective. Yeah, so my name's Jake Kasson. As you said, I uh, started Movement, co-founder, um, started in 2013 and sold in, uh, I think, 2018 to Movado. Oh. Um, but yeah, I've been an entrepreneur my entire life, man. I think, uh, started originally when I was in high school, just kind of like accidentally, like kind of we all do, right? Like wanting to make some money or just accidentally stumbling into something. And, um, and you want me to just dive right into like what yeah, I started or like, what I, I also want to touch on a quick thing I read too, was that your father was an entrepreneur. I want you to touch on that as well, because it's ironic, ironic enough, almost all the people on the show almost nobody comes from a background where their parents are entrepreneurs. And I found it very unique that yours did. So what'd you learn from your dad? Right yeah. Now? So my dad was an entrepreneur, but he had a credit reporting business, which I still to this day don't understand exactly what he did. Um, but all I knew is like he had this big, you know, business that I didn't understand. He had 40 employees. So I saw, I saw him and his business, uh, and it, it ended up going under in the uh, 2008, um, you know, crisis, whatever. So, what I did learn from him, though, is he was always like pushing me to just go out and do stuff. I think the, the thing about my dad is he, and this is, could be a fault too of his, is he just likes to like, you know, his, his hands are always like, he's spread thin. He always tries to do something. He has an idea and he's just, he goes after. He may have like three or four things at a time. And, um, but he was always pushing me to paint curbs. He was pushing me to, you know, for Christmas, we'd go and sell like little mistletoe packages and, and like write a little poem and, and go door to step to door step. So he was just constantly pushing me to go and do stuff. So I think I had that, I think more than anything of like entrepreneurial advice he's given me, it wasn't so much of like, I learned how to, you know, build a brand. Um, I didn't learn that from him. I just learned like the hustle and go out and get it and, and try and, and whatnot. So that, that was really the, the majority of what kind of he taught me, which was just, I think just inspired me and, and, and gave me the, the, uh, the permission to just go out and try. A lot of parents are like, you know, go get a college degree, do it this way, go get a job. My dad wasn't really that because he didn't, he didn't go about it that way, right? He, he went to college, but um, for, for me, college was just go out, have fun, meet people, network. Uh, he didn't care as much about that. And by the time I even got into college, I already had a business. So my dad didn't even care if I, you know, had graduated or not. Um, Shout out Mr. Casting. Great <laughs> fucking fun. I love this shit. Yeah. So that, I think having that was, was I think, and I, and I took it for granted, but understanding now that like, there's a lot of parents out there that aren't supportive of their kids having Shopify businesses or any business at that. Cause they don't understand it. And when people don't understand something, they often don't approve of it. Cause they just don't get it. My dad didn't even really understand why I was doing watches. I mean, there's multiple times throughout my journey early on probably first year or two that he was like okay what are you going to do with this you figured out how to sell watches online go teach other people how to sell stuff online he wanted me to be a consultant essentially because that was another idea i had because i i wasn't even you know confident in where movement was going to go early early days uh first year we did a million dollars and and i think he thought i was going to plateau at that at the, uh, plateau at a million dollars in my head i obviously saw you know the vision and and, and the momentum so for me it was you know, I'm not ready to go and figure out what, you know, what else I can do in terms of, you know, consulting or whatever. I want to, I want to see this project through. So let's rewind one, one more thing before we get into movement. Cause I'm sure the whole show we're going to be talking about that is, uh, the glow in the dark t-shirts. Yeah. And then obviously I read that you put up your fucking car to yeah. get the money to eventually do it. Do, so you want, just, do you want me to, do you want me to run through like my story of like that, that young or just go through that specific glow thread? Go, go through that specific one. I was probably 16. I didn't even oh, have my okay. driver's license yet. So I had to pay a kid basically a com like commission. I was like, yo, come with me. 
I'll give you 20% of whatever we sell, go out, we'll have, I'll buy you dinner, like sell the shirts with me. And, and for context for people listening, like how much were you making? 10 grand, 20 grand, 100 grand? Um, so it's a good question. I, I think I, I didn't start making a lot of money until I sold through those t-shirts. So probably I made maybe like five or 10 grand through that, right? Over the course of two months. And then I didn't really start making a lot of money until I built an e-commerce website and I put the shirts on and I was selling one shirt a week, like not really anything. Um, and then I created this uh, viral video on YouTube. This was back when like you can do really clickbaity stuff and YouTube didn't even have, you know, any way to, to, to combat clickbait stuff. And I got like 500,000 views on a couple of videos and started selling $10,000 worth of t-shirts. Like I think it was a week. Uh, it didn't last for that long. It was a couple months, but still I had all this money and then I reinvested it back in the business. And, but I saw like, you know, 10, I was going to the bank and the teller at the bank, this grown man was like, literally like the scene in, in uh, Wolf of Wall Street. He was like, you know, can I come work for you? Like pretty much that I'm like the 16, 17 year old kid. I didn't even understand. I didn't even understand like what that type of money meant at that age where people were just like, it was a weird, it was weird showing these like deposit slips or withdrawal slips to, I was sending money using Western Union to China, just like bringing in 10K. Like it was the weirdest thing, but. You know, it's a question I've never asked, which a lot of people don't ask is, what was the bridge between that and then starting movement? And why did you stop doing that and then go to movement? People don't, there, there's never an end in why people stop. Like, why'd you stop doing it? Yeah, so, so I, honestly, it was just making some poor decisions that ultimately I got put out of business. I went bankrupt essentially. So uh, I created this whole rave light business. I went to EDC and saw the rave lights in the crowd and same thing next day, I go on Google. No one was selling that, that, all that stuff. And so I built a brand based off of the lights, the outfits, all that stuff and created a $150,000, $200,000 business, e-commerce business in 2009, 2010. I dropped out of college completely at this point. For this? For this. I was like, wow. I was like done. Uh, I still had my lease because like it was just it was kind of complicated and I decided to I had an opportunity to go open a store in the Northridge Mall in the Valley um, and I did that spent a bunch of money to do that and had to stock it with inventory employees and my overhead just went up ridiculously and people didn't really care about shop like I just couldn't get shoppers in there it just wasn't the ROI wasn't there. So fast forward eight months, I'm basically just drowning in you know, my, my expenses and I end up closing it and my competitor in the same eight months basically spent his time ramping up, putting all that money back into his e-commerce store. So just, I just saw- The silver lining is right there. Yeah, exactly. So when I go, my next thing, hence movement, yeah. in my head, I'm like, retail is dying. I saw it. I saw at early stage what happened to me. That's not something that I'm even gonna worry about out the gate. Um, and then I got, you know, kind of entwined in the world of, you know, uh, crowdfunding Indiegogo Kickstarter and, um, was able to get the funding there and then just off to the races for, you know, e-commerce domination. So with that, it kind of looks like, um, I look at that and I look at movement. I think that the, the big thing for both of those was finding the white space. Um, so, so I know a lot of, it's crazy nowadays. If you fucking click on our art, you're getting ads from all the other art companies. If you click on movement, you're getting ads from all the other watch companies. I see millions of watch companies out there. Were you guys, was it saturated when you first came in? Or were you guys the only guys that came in? No, when we first started, there was no one else doing, like offering the direct to consumer kind of pricing model, just even just thinking about a brand with, you know, e-commerce in mind first, with social media in mind first. Um, what year was this? We, we originally launched in, we started like developing the watches in 2012. Um, so that's when like that original idea came and honestly it wasn't back then it was even just what watch brands are out there that have that are really positioned towards like kind of younger demographic and didn't and weren't just tied to a lot of the brands the bigger brands didn't even have like a great brand presence social media was was weak and then you had some that like really pigeonholed themselves in a specific no content yeah just a, or, mm. or just like so specific of a demographic that that it was just so niche that it didn't even work so I think we, it was more about the brand. And then as we scaled and I knew a lot about e-commerce quickly realized like, okay, we can just, let's just take this and, and move forward with e-commerce. I think we didn't understand necessarily that e-commerce could be, you know, 50, 60, 70 plus million dollar business. Um, I think that to us was, we were, we were still working on that because Facebook ads was still like unknown at that time. Uh, no, the no golden age, low CPAs <laughs> bless you. Yeah. Um, so, 
Let's talk about, you know, you're saying, you know, you're learning about social media, you're learning about this stuff. How are you learning about this? Because for me, we have this network of kind of CEOs out here, a lot of people that we know. And I feel like you, of all of them, are one of, if not the most knowledgeable knowledgeable in paid acquisition, knowing yeah. what AOV is, knowing what LTV is, knowing what multi-touch attribution is. What have you been doing since the beginning? How do you learn? Let's talk about that. How do you learn outside of doing? Um, well, early days, it was, you know, there was a handful of blogs that you can kind of like subscribe to and learn. And this was early days where like no one else was really, you know, there was very few people kind of that, that I think that the difference, the challenge is now versus then. Now it's everyone's doing it. It's how do you figure out, you know, how to like where the white space is. Back then it was no one's telling you influencers. No one tell, is telling you Facebook ads. You had to you had to decide, am I going to go spend my time on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, you know, the new Did Snapchat. Did you run Facebook ads? Yeah, oh, that was but, my next question. Like, yeah. yeah, initially, initially. So basically that, wow. that's that. Initially, that's where we found like the success. So like we were selling, you know, maybe 30 watches a day, um, which was a, still a lot. That was, you know, maybe three grand uh, worth of watches, maybe a little bit more a day. And then I started to play around with Facebook and pretty much overnight, once I figured out Facebook. So right, you were in the account running the ads. I was running it myself. Pretty much figured it out and we started selling basically 100 watches. So we pretty much tripled the amount of watches literally overnight. I mean, like one week we were selling 30, the next week it was a hundred minimum. And from there it was like, I started, I, then I was like, okay, there's nothing else I'm gonna do that's gonna triple my business mm -hmm. like this. I'm gonna invest all my time into learning this. Obviously you have 10 other things you have to do, but once I started to get the hang of it, then I started to go yeah. and find people who were sophisticated as well, which was really challenging to do. So we kind of found someone who we worked with and I'd kind of work alongside them, but at some point my goal was like delegate so that I can go and think about hiring and you know product and brand and everything else. So well, let's talk about how long it took you to learn that because for me I feel like well that's uh, one question I get all the time like from people who have new businesses they go Jeff like how do I run ads how do I run ads and these are like very new startups you know probably have maybe one to two people like literally like what is your advice to them like you obviously were in the ad account you were the co-founder like. I want, to, I want to know about time. I think getting yeah. to an 8 out of 10 is fairly easy. And then obviously the delta between an 8 out of 10 to 10 out of 10 being world class is obviously a lifetime of learning. But if you're someone that's someone like you who's street smart, has some business sense, and you go into a Facebook account, how long does it take you? How many hours does it take you to be a 7 out of 10? It's tough. I mean, the... the Facebook in general, Ads Manager, has changed drastically since I, I can't even remember exactly all the tools that we had. It was probably a little more simplified, but I think if you're able to run a successful e-commerce business, you're, if you consider yourself tech savvy, like intuitive with, you know, when you, when Apple comes out with a new, uh, you know, update, like you're just able to pick stuff up. If you're good with that type of stuff, software, which I always was, you know, if I spent a few weeks on it, I, you see the progress, right? The issue is, is you have to invest money. So I think that's yeah. the scary thing here. And I think it's hard to say, I think, as we all know, it's a combination of like the content you have and then also, you know, the, just the ads and money that you have to like kind of put towards it. I, I don't know that I can put a time in. I think, I think, you know, a few weeks, I, like you're able to start to see progress on it. I don't think it's going to, especially with the blogs that are out there, like it, there, there's some learning curves. Like there's so many CPA, CPOs, LTV, like there's so many words that you have to kind of understand, but um, with the resources today, I got to imagine that you could pick it up pretty quickly. Back then, like there was one guy yeah. who I would just listen to his podcast. I would watch his videos and it took me a couple weeks to like really, and you just, you're testing. Like we started with probably spending, you know, and it was like maybe a hundred bucks a day, right? It was like, let's just see, you know, cause it takes some time for the metrics to obviously update too, just to see if, you know, if someone clicks on an ad comes back a week later, like it takes a week for someone for a consumer to even buy your product. So I'd say like a month should give you some general readings. For me, I, for me, when I t talk to a brand now, I tell them like, give it three months. The first two months might be you go and you, you're spending at a break even or maybe even slightly uh -huh. a loss. Don't obviously, if you don't have a lot of money to lose, don't go out and lose a bunch of money. But hopefully, you know, month one you're losing, not hopefully, but worst case scenario, you're losing some money month one, but you're seeing progress month two. And ideally, maybe month three, you're either break even or, or, or it's, it's, you're seeing it progress where from that point on, you can continue to, to iterate because you're going to know what ads are working. When you start for day one, you have 10 ads. Maybe only one of them is like the winner, right? And then month two, you're taking that one winner and you're chopping it up. Yeah, you're replicating it. And then month three, ideally, you have so much data and knowledge that you're just figuring out how to iterate from there. So um, I think also just reading the reports 
And Facebook, a lot of people, I just don't think are looking at it correctly. I honestly think that's a big issue. People just don't understand how to read the reports. They see something, they go, oh, that's not working. And then when you chop it up, you're like, okay, well, this worked. What if we just do more of this? Or yeah. this ad works. You know, I think there's just a lot of like learnings there. I also feel like a lot of startups don't spend enough money. They think a thousand dollars a month. Oh, I and they're gonna get a good my fucking yeah. mind. Yeah. Like, dude, People I spend like a hundred th- racks a month, and they're like, I'm spending a hundred dollars a day on ads. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, yeah. A monkey could spend two hundred dollars yeah. a day on ads, yeah. and you're at least gonna break even. Yeah. Not you're not gonna end. find any. Yeah. I yeah, I think it's just you just gotta, and I think it's a skill set because of how big Facebook can make your brand. It's gotta be a skill set that you invest in, right? Because at least you have to understand it. And if it's not you, it's either someone that works for you that's like you're really close to and can trust. Someone in your company, I think, has to be close to that. It, I, I really worry when, when people, unless you already have revenue and you can afford to go hire some big agency, where like, yeah, if you have a big wholesale business, maybe you have the luxury of being able to go hire a, a, you know, a, a top tier agency you know has worked. But if you're a startup, like you, your co-founder, someone early on has to really at least understand it because they're going to be either running it or managing someone who's running it and you want to be able to identify. I think it. somebody with sweat equity has to have yeah. that for sure. Yeah. It, so, I was going to say one, one quick, and, and what was that creative like back then? Like the first, you know, first maybe couple of months of movement. Who, yeah. who was doing the content? What did it look like? Uh, to be honest, more of it was on Facebook. So back then it was like, you remember that side rail? Like, do you remember like, I don't think I don't even think Facebook has this. You used to have this like side rail where you could. It was like really gross, but uh, they had tools that can help you create the content. No, no, no. Well, yeah, they did. No, but the like the Facebook, basically Facebook's UI has changed drastically since then. So there was like two major uh, like ad units. One was on the side, and then one was in the feed. Yeah. Uh, in the feed, it was for the most part, it was just like a really high quality picture of a watch. Um, just we, this. Not even that. Just a static sitting there. We had these like. We paid this one photographer, the first photographer we ever used, we paid him 200 bucks for like 30 images. This was like in college when we were still there. And those images lasted us for like two years. Do you uh, hear that, guys? Yeah. Yeah, literally. <laughs> 200 bucks, 30 images. And he was a good photographer, but like they were just like, it was a table like this, lighting, and it was just a picture of the watch. But it it just, it was crisp and it worked. And, and we tested a bunch of stuff and it was just this one specific watch, the specific image. We, there was like two or three images that were very similar and it just worked in the feed. Nowadays though, I'm like, you know, with Instagram stories and everything else, like it's almost, sometimes the most UGC stuff You said it, works it's the fucking best. bullshit. Yeah. yeah. The shittier the quality yeah. video, the better Where we're spending money, yeah, we're spending You're spending money on movies <laughs> yeah, that fucking yeah, yeah. get terrible return. Yeah, yeah. It's bullshit. Yeah. So 20, let's say 2012 to 2016, 2017, I'd say you're in the Facebook gold rush era. What do you attribute to your growth? Because I know you've always been kind of slow and steady growing. What do you think is the biggest reason why movement was the one that stayed alive and kept growing them? It, sorry, what, what, what time frame? The beginning, first five years. Um, I mean, I think us being one of the first, I mean, we're really the first D2C, but like, I think there were some other watch brands that had launched around that same time, but being one of the first, I think having an acquisition and, and like, really focusing on building the brand through kind of uh, digital channels where maybe some people were focused on, you know, wholesale still. I think we realized, you know, where the ball was going, right? It was like Instagram, influencers, um, Facebook, and we were very, and once we saw success in Facebook, that validated so much for us to be like, okay, let's figure out what's next. Yeah. Pinterest, we were crushing on Pinterest at one yeah. point. Yeah, at one point we were. Um, so it's just like figuring out, yeah, what worked. Podcasts, obviously, TV. I mean, like we did so much because that was just we knew it worked, and we were getting customers telling us, "Oh, I heard you on Joe Rogan," or "I saw you here." Like, so we were just instantly validating all of that. So, I think uh, honestly, a lot of like the the lessons I learned, don't, you know, I saw retail not work. You know, I think that or rewind ten years ago, if if we were to have been a brand that was booming, like retail would have been a step maybe sooner than anything else we did. But we knew that like, I knew personally from my experience, I didn't want to get into retail. I didn't know a lot about retail. We were able to stay you know, relatively lean. We were shipping globally. So for me, it was always like, how do we offer a better experience for our customers anywhere in the world? That was kind of like my- yeah. what, I was curious, when did you find your like lifestyle identity in movement? How early on? Because obviously it's, it's gotten more and more. I mean, obviously Instagram has been a huge, uh, you know, 
yeah. reason for that. But when did that start? That lifestyle, that movement it probably lifestyle? started maybe year three. Honestly, we got an office. Like we we always wanted to be like, you know, uh, like the modern day gentleman. We wanted to have like you know, uh, well dressed, but also like a watch that you can go and like wear casually, but also something that like if you know job interview or if, you know at a wedding, like we wanted something that kind of like blended between lifestyles. Um, but then we started to like, I think when Blake and Spencer really joined, those guys, you know, are, are definitely the more creative, you know, people we had at the company and they were really helping just build out that identity brand Bibles, like who our customer is. Um, and then we started just think about, you know, who we work with imagery, social media, like the way we even thought about our Instagram and think about our Instagram in terms of like aesthetically, how does it look? Just the feed in general and just everything from there. It was yeah, Spencer and, and Blake definitely helped. Yeah, because I think that. I think you guys were like the a staple company in using Instagram as like your lifestyle kind of vision. Yeah, almost it's, like a mood board. I always looked. Know? Yeah, that's what it, I yeah. always looked at like a mood board. It's funny. I, I think I and I don't know. I think we just wanted valid. Not I don't know. If validation is the right word, but we wanted. I think publicity also. Like we wanted to like cement ourselves as the, you know, online watch brand. Um, so like. I think we all, like, I always did like different podcasts or we got in blogs, like whether it was business stuff or it would, like, so it also helped. I think that also like put us as like somewhat of a poster child in, in terms of like Shopify and some of these other, cause we also want Shopify to build a business. So I think we got a lot of press from just doing things right quickly. And then like, if, if we had an opportunity, maybe some founders would have like said, no, like I, I jumped on stuff just cause for me, I was like anyone, any of these people, whether it's even like Shopify clients were potential business uh, or potential customers of ours. So like, yeah, we just wanted press and wanted to get our name out there as much as possible. It was a win in our eyes. So, so a lot of the listeners are Jay Casson when he's 15 years old and they, they want to figure out a way to get from Jay Casson 15 to a, a nine figure exit. So I want to go into strictly from your position, which the CEO of the company, the founder of the company, what goes into it? Because for me, the one thing with you that I don't even know if you know this, but I don't know if you even, you probably don't even know this. In 2016, when we first started talking, I just saw the email, it's October 2nd, 2016, we had a couple thousand dollars uh, in revenue. He actually reached out to buy one of your pieces. And then I met with you and we spoke. And at that point, I was ready to give you equity in the company. I was literally <laughs> talking to you, you were, you, were a guy, you, were a guy that, you were a guy that knew way, way more than I knew. And I kind of like pushed the collab on you, we were talking. And you had no fucking part in it. And it's funny that you said that your dad was always doing a bunch of things because I think you're the complete opposite. I've always looked at you as a guy that was very fucking focused. Very focused. You didn't do any fucking side shit. You focused. The main thing was the main thing always for you. And lo and behold, you focused and you had a huge acquisition. So for me, from an outside looking in, from what I see, focus for me and discipline is, is two things. I always look at you. I'm like, wow, you're super focused. Why don't you tell everybody just like some of the main things that you think are necessary to be a leader of a company, how to take you to the next level? What are some big things that you think are, are musts? Yeah, I mean, I think that, to me, that was like something important to me. I think you need to know, you have to have the vision for whatever you're doing, right? So for me, like I always saw, I, I, I knew that the, the potential of movement and to me, like that's all that kind of mattered. So I wanted to be, and also it, like, it does set an example on the people working for you. Like this is like, you're join everyone's joining together right we're all do we all have different aspects of the company we're all doing different responsibilities but like we want this thing to get to you know the finish line and we want we want to you know get the brand to be a global brand and um so i think something that's important i tell founders at least is like when you have a business there's a million things to do especially early on especially early on like when you're early stages and you know you, you have some revenue coming in i think that it's very important to focus on ways to, to generate revenue. I know that sounds obvious, but like when you can generate revenue, everything else gets a little easier, right? There's so like, and, and examples of this are back in, you know, when I had my other brand, I would focus on making stuff look as sexy and cool as possible. Like our logo treatment, we'd have this like graphic and I'd spend 500 bucks on it and my competitor would have something less appealing, but the content, he was putting out twice as much content, right? And he was crushing it. Uh, so just realizing like, you know, bringing revenue in sales cares all. Yeah. And it, it allows you to go and then reinvest in other areas that actually will make the brand look better long term. So yeah. I think it's just like, that's, that's something that, that I always stuck to. If it wasn't bringing a return on investment or had the potential to at some point, I'd really, there had to be a, a strong reason as yeah. to why. 
I think that was big for us in the beginning too. I mean, we oh, we were right we when were, we got we were Facebook, so we revenue were, yeah, focused. Yeah. We were not brand focused at all. And yeah, we obviously just like with you, a yeah, we, years shifted. In, we shifted to brand, and that's what helped us kind of kind of get to the next level. Yeah. What about that that moment? And I'm like, I've been in that moment kind of like the last year where you kind of have to like elevate and delegate and hire people and the thing that you used to be doing and you were super passionate about now somebody else is doing and you need to worry about you know focusing on the next hire or the next campaign what was that like for you because you were the you were the fucking media buyer yeah i mean you were everything i mean you i mean you know what i'm saying so yeah. what was that like what's that transition like for you yeah you go from knowing literally everything that's going on in every single piece and then you're like okay, am I even doing the best job I can because I'm sp spread th so thin? And then you have to delegate. Um, so you have to find someone who you, you trust and feel like can delegate or that you can delegate to. And then you have to, you know, ideally have some sort of metrics or have some way to hold them accountable. Um, you know, I think I'm not a great operator. That's something I've learned. Like, and when it comes to like running and managing, you know, people and delegating, like I'm good at like delegating, but following up, keeping them accountable, like having meetings to make sure that they're, 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 you know, progressing and doing the right job, like was always a little bit of a challenge for me. I'm very much like, I need to have my hands on something. So delegating, although I understood it was important, it was still challenging for me to like really keep tabs and make sure. So, so we had, you know, I, that's why I hired a CMO because the CMO came in and like he ran the marketing team and he held them accountable because he's also been there. He's been managing people for 15 years, right? So he's gone through, he's been managed for 10 years, 15 years really until he joined with us. So he had all that experience of like, you know, what were his expectations? So I think he, he knew going into a more managerial role, like what, you know, what was required out of him and managing someone like that, who's already, you know, managed a team of 20 is much easier in my opinion than managing some more junior, you know, people in their twenties uh, who are, who are kind of running around, you know, new to the, new to their career essentially. Um, so, I mean, those, I, I would say learning how to keep them accountable though is like the most important. Like if you're gonna delegate, you're not gonna be able to always see everything that's going on. And you're gonna have to trust them also. Micromanaging is, is, is can be bad, really bad. And also be demoralizing to the employee. Um, so I think you have to, if you set expectations and they're not hitting those expectations, then that's where you can come in and say, well, you're not doing your job. but telling them to do something and then coming in and then changing that and then flipping back and forth like that, it will, will quickly burn out, you know, employees. So. Oh, Mark, I think me and him are a lot more alike than I thought. What, huh? <laughs> yeah. In terms of, yeah. In terms of being an operator. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, well, the, and the thing is, is, again, I don't enjoy, I'm not, you also need someone. I don't fucking enjoy holding people in KPIs, <laughs> Jeff. I don't know if fucking, you gotta be I mean, a fucking, better at it you gotta be me. a fucking, but I'm like you, like, that's I, not saying much, bro. Cause you don't want to, you don't want to fucking, he doesn't want to talk to anybody over yeah. here. But it's hard. I mean, I, I get I get both of you guys. Like, first off, you know, there's always you have to realize what you're good at. Yeah. Like as an operator. So if I was if I thought I was the best media buyer, then I would be a media that's all I would do, and I would hire a CEO to go run the company, right? What I what I like, I felt like I had the right vision for the business. I was hiring the right talent. I think when we got to, you know, thirty plus people, that's where I started to really feel like, okay, I need some help in different areas. We had a COO, uh, we had the CMO. You know, we started to you know, promote some VP, uh, VPs of the business to really manage and, and run their team. Cause I didn't, I didn't want to run a 30 person team and like felt like that's what I was great at. When we were, you know, 10 people, I felt like I could have my hands in a bunch and be holding and, and really manage people to, to some regard, but. Um, I'm with you on that. Yeah. We had, we had yeah. that magic number of about 10. I'm scared to go higher. Yeah, yeah. I'm scared of the 30. I'm yeah. fucking scared of that. I think I will say that like, you know, I, if you have a chance to, if you're, if you're scaling and you, your company can afford to hire someone who's really thinking about people, if you don't enjoy it, if you, or if you can't do it, if you feel like someone else is going to do a better job, then it's something that just like be a well, you have to be self-aware and obviously be in a financially, you know, good position to be able to do this. But if you're at 10, 15 people, ideally you can, you know, adding one hire to take the load off and, and manage and make sure people are held accountable. The ROI should be that. That's another thing I always, whenever I think about hiring early stage, it's like, if I hire this person, is either A, are, is they, are they gonna make me more money than what I pay, am paying them? Or B, are they gonna free up my time and I'm gonna be able to go make this company more money? Usually, like, that should be the, now, now obviously you have, like, if it's gonna take 12 months for them to, to, to pay back, then are you in a financially good place to do that? Like, there's some, you know, kind of pros and cons there that you have to weigh out, but that's kind of how I always thought about 
you know, hiring yeah. people. But Jake, Jake with his subliminal nuggets right there. Is, that's a hitter right there. That's is, so true. Is that something you think about before they hire, or is that something that you you kind of ev- evaluate, like, during, like, I was curious of that. Like, the like KPIs of, of hiring someone new with kind of that uncertainty of the ROI. Um, it's tough because that's why I started to hire – like CMOs and people who have been there, done that, because they had a little bit more input as to what expectations are out of the role. It's hard to hire. When I had to hire for a CMO, that was a, that was a challenging hire because you're, you're looking for, like we all, uh, marketing. But like, why am I about to go pay this, you know, uh, a, a solid six figure, you know, salary to a CMO when, like, what, what are you going to be doing exactly? Dude, literally, <laughs> this is the comments me and Mark had, yeah. I think, back and forth. Jake helped, is like, Jake helped I me know. identify the job spec for our CMO. No, it's funny. I'm like, literally, yeah. I'm like, Mark, sit down and explain to me why we need a CMO. Like, it was hard for me to get, like, yeah, just yeah. internalize I, what. Is it because it's macro listen, thinking? I know. think that's a good yeah. question, though. Because I think that's what's good about co-founders is, is and, I, and, and honestly, this is part of, like, my co-founder kind of, questioning me on, on certain things. I think my when I when I figured out Facebook, that was like, okay, you got you're figuring shit out like you know, like we don't have to like have conversations about everything, but when you're going to go and hire a six-figure CMO, like that's that's a conversation. Like what is he going to be doing here? She going to be doing? And then that's a good process to like run through like, okay, well, really what are they going to be doing? And some stuff is quantifiable. I think managing a marketing team right they're not going to be running ads necessarily but they're going to be managing those teams to make sure spend is more efficient like they're going to be in the weeds to some degree on this but i think talking to cmos interviewing cmos and asking and i think you can just be transparent especially like hey like you know we haven't hired someone of this magnitude in, in your you know in your job title like what exa- what kind of value do you think you bring to a company like us I think the biggest delta and the biggest hire in any company that's online is the CMO or the head of growth. Yeah. That for I remember I went to your office too and you told you told me how important that one hire was for you. It changes everything. Oh, it changed everything for us. Yeah. The efficiencies with spends. Yeah. So your company uh, started off it was just men's watches, and you broke the law of line extension from my favorite book, Twenty Two Immutable Laws of Marketing. We're in the process of potentially breaking that rule as well. So what was the rationale? What's for the rule? You stay in one line, which you guys had built out men's watches. What was the rationale for women's watches? Uh, the glasses, which I spoke to Blake about. It. He told me that they were doing well. Um, what was that whole entire thought process? For people out there, you have one product, you're crushing it with that product, but maybe you want to get to the next level. What was that thought process going into those other verticals? Why? So, well, women's watches, we just had a lot of women purchasing men's watches for anniversaries or Christmas or whatever. So that was we already knew we had a, a female consumer not necessarily buying yeah. you know women's product but um we also had demand for it so i think listening to your customers uh if your customers are telling you to come out with something and i think also the jump from well it is challenging men's and women's it's like okay we're like well do we separate the instagram pages do we you know think how do we think about the website it does change things drastically so it is something that to consider fortunately for us it's not like we're selling clothing so you know, sizes aren't really as big of an issue, right? It's a one size fits all. So I think for our business, it like, it, it worked. Um, I think the jump was more aggressive from watches to sunglasses. That's, that's where it was like, okay, this isn't just like, we already knew how to make watches, manufacture, like that was pretty seamless. A completely new product category category is like where it gets challenging. So, and also it's like, well, sunglasses could be, you know, whatever, 10, 25% of the business, whatever, you know, you're not sure, but is it going to take 10 or 25% of your time to launch, to maintain? Those are the questions you kind of have to ask yourself. So unless there's something that you're like, this can be a great pivot, not even a pivot, but a product extension, category extension that really crushes, then I think it's like worth having that conversation. But um, and I, I like to say that like until your category really hits like – like it didn't plateau when we launched, but we, we, there was, you saw the plateau coming we used to, for men's. We, 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 yeah. Like we felt like we were getting bigger and bigger. Like we saw the opportunity in women's. We felt like if we didn't move now, then someone else was going to, you know, eat our lunch there. So yeah, we made that decision. Um, I think again, sunglasses was like manufacturers, you know, product knowledge, designing it even like there was just the content, the, shoots the content. The angles. Yeah, yeah. Even the product photography, it was like all these things that were really challenging. I think that had I you know done it over, we would have started maybe with jewelry first because it's same risk space, right? It just that you know even suppliers are kind of like in the same network. That would have been a quick kind of A to B. Mm-hmm. 
Um, Fat fucking margins, too. Jewelry. Yeah, jewelry is great. So, like, Fatties. I think had we started earlier, like, men's watches, women's watches, men's jewelry, women's jewelry, it would have been a better progression. You know, sunglasses are great and are, and are doing well, especially, like, ever scrolls, and we've had some sunnies be absolute home runs. But I just think advice to, a, a you know, an entrepreneur in a specific category, it's like, unless you want to... Like I, there's probably a, if you not a pivot but a, a category extension that yeah. makes more sense. Well, here's I mean this is me and Mark debate about this all the time, but it's like my my advice would be just to wait because there was I don't even know how many times that we thought we that canvases is plateauing, but we were wrong. I mean that's happened. God, I mean it could be three three years or maybe two years now that we we thought we should start pivoting in product extension, but we. We've just been waiting, yeah, um, and optimizing. So I mean, that's I think that's so been. I, I think one new of the, products are coming out, guys, <laughs> and they are fucking good. I think one of the things <laughs> they're right over there. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the things too is just like you know what channels are you advertising in? Like, um, if you feel like you've somewhat depleted those channels, right? The Facebooks, Instagram, TV, podcasts. Like, there's a lot of channels for new eyeballs, right? So that's something that like if you start to hit all those you know, all those places, maybe it does make sense to like, you know, think about a new category, but also it's just, but, but just make sure that like, when you think about a new category, you, you really understand like, yeah, all the challenge challenges, resources, money that's going to go into it. And like, it's good to like have some sort of a forecast to kind of hold yourself accountable to like, we think this is going to be 10%, 20% of the business. Um, you obviously have no idea, but ideally you have some sort of idea and some sort of guess that, just kind of helps you hold yourself accountable. And then if it's not working at some point, then, you know, you're able to either pivot or pull the plug if it's not working at some point. So yeah, we were working on this shit for a long time. I just just feel like there's always a false sense of distribution cap in a lot of, you know, instances. So it gets tough. We won't know. Yeah. It's almost like you will really never know. Yeah. Unless, like I said, we just, just been waiting and we just keep finding new ways to optimize. There's also stories though of people who, I don't think it's not pivot, but a category extension, brand extension, and it just crushes. And that ends up being the hero product. Yeah. So, Even though they're not known for it. I've heard of a lot of those stories. Like yeah. they, they crush it with a product category they're not even known for. Yeah. Like the Everscroll glasses definitely did good for you, COVID. Yeah, oh, 100%. I mean, Everscrolls, if we, yeah, I mean, that could have been, you know, you could we could have rolled that out in its own separate business and just ran with that and done, you know, a whole gamer extension and like everything else, right? That could be its own you know, business for sure. Um, and I know I have, we have mutual friends. I, I won't say, but like they're, they're like, they have, they're pivoted slightly in terms of like a product that like you start with a product, it ends up, you are where you are. Maybe there's some challenges that you didn't expect. Now, you know what, you know, it's like, okay, well, we're going to launch this new product, this new category. And if that starts to take, sometimes that'll take off just given you already have infrastructure, having infrastructure, which you guys do a lot of brands do with their first product. It's hard to like, it's hard to like, be willing to pivot. Now your guys' business is great, but like there's some people who are just struggling to get over the hump and they've been in business for five years and like they're just starting to do it. And then and then like they make a small pivot or a different, you know, category extension and that just hit you know, it's it's more D2C friendly or it's more, you know, whatever it is, like there's some advantages to it and then that can end up being the hero product uh and, and be the core of the business at some point. So yeah. biggest mistake that you've made in movement. Oh, I gotta think about this, man. Biggest mistake. Give us a fucking shitty mistake, Jake. Give I don't make mistakes, shitty, man. Give us a um, shitty mistake. Mistakes made. Um, I found a seventeen thousand dollar check that from three years ago that never cashed, and it's capped at one year. I'm having oh, my sister my try and call to get it. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, you get that. That was a mistake from yesterday, guys. Seventeen thousand. Um, I can't think of any ones that are like super. Not hiring someone fast enough, not investing in this, not doubling down in this channel, selling too early, selling too late. Um, I mean, yeah, I guess I, I, no, it's not some, anything specific, but I mean, obviously hindsight's twenty twenty, right? I feel yeah. like there's a lot that in terms of, you know, uh, you know, maybe what functions or, you know, maybe, you know, I think potentially even like there were some wholesale opportunities that we could have, uh, done quicker or um 
I think actually like potentially maybe having someone to like focus on the people of the organization earlier, like uh, as we talked about kind of a chief happiness officer. Exactly. Yeah. Something along yeah. the lines of that. Shout like, out like, what do they call it? Pe- uh, chief of staff or something, right? Mm-hmm. Like um, where you have someone who's like really focusing on the day to day people. And, and I don't know that that was always just something like we just had a, a younger office. Right. So I think it was just not, everyone was great and innovative in what we were doing because it was all new. Like, you know, you're not going to find someone who was, you know, in their forties who knew a lot about Instagram because they just didn't use it. But back then, right. But, but like managing people, it's like, you can't really have experience managing people when you're 24, 25. So having someone who was helping with that process probably would have been, uh, would have been good for us. Where do you see movement? Five years. Give us, give us, uh, some tidbits on where you see movement going in five years. Yeah, I mean, we're still, you know, we're still, right now it's a crazy time, obviously, but, you know, I think we're, we're focused on some cool collaborations. We're trying to really focus on the brand, you know, thinking about some kind of unique uh, product and categories as well. I think, you know, watches are definitely our core and we're still working on that. I think it's just, we're trying to really focus on the brand right now and just continue to elevate the brand. And I think, you know, collabs have been, so we just, did a collab with Rory Kramer, uh, hey. sunglasses, which we're stoked about, and just trying to find you know more kind of like-minded people who are you know our demographic likes, who are friends of the brand. I think that's something as you guys could probably attest to, as we did one with you guys too, like uh, being friends of the brand. Uh, you know, knowing our demographic, you know, fucks with you guys. Like just having that type of uh, relationship really elevates the brand. And how uh, Jeff perform? Let's perform. talk. Let's talk about it on air. Did anybody yeah. saw it quicker than him right now? Let's just let's just anyway. let's just give Jeff a smile right now. I anybody think, saw it fast? He saw it fast, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, I think it was. I think it. I think it was like five, five minutes or less, right? What? No, for, for all the five hundred watt. Or, wasn't it? No, no it was, I think it was like four, four days. Okay, so five minutes was our anniversary. Watch. But I do no, have four days. And it was I, I do have that. the least distribution out of anyone you've collabed with. Just saying. What do you mean, just like followers and everything, or yeah, just distribution yeah. And, and. Do you want to know Jeff? So, I think I'll just say this. I think you're. I think. In terms of time frame, yours was like the most successful collab Let's that we've go. done. Yeah, you know I mean, why? I love this. Je- Jeff used to be a little emotional bitch, and now he doesn't make product for himself. He makes it for the market, and he picked black and white, which would sell well, and it did well. well some of those other people are, sell- are are doing some shit that they liked. Yeah, it's not about yeah, what you yeah, like yeah, sometimes. Yeah. I just, I mean, I think you guys gotta listen very clear to that one. It's not about what you like all the time. It's about what your fucking consumer consumer likes. Yeah. That's challenging. Even at movement, we've always that. That's been as especially as you scale. That's another thing to really focus on is, you know, you're gonna get older. You're gonna your interests are gonna change. Defining and and, and understanding what your cons- who your consumer is, what they like, and and really trying to stick to that or adapt that over time, uh, is important. Yeah. Well, I think I mean he, he- even with iconic, like we have, you know, I design pieces that I know are gonna sell for the mass, but then I know there's those pieces that completely are going to contrast that that are just elevating and probably won't sell but they they're for a different you know segment they mean something different for like the brand catalog yeah um, but you need your staples yeah. and you need like and that's the difference i think for you guys too it's like the difference between the copycats who are just gonna you know try and do some clickbaity you know shit art or just copy you guys versus i'm seeing ads in downtown la uh Penthouse is now studio, God guys. Damn. You guys can't get you any more original are, than that. You guys will shit. move out of here, and then <laughs> someone will be back in here doing the same. Yeah, shit. we have we have knockoffs taking content in our own building. That's yeah, absolutely. really in your building? It's yeah. it's absolutely ridiculous. I, I was getting I get DMs from people, and it says posts unavailable because I'm obviously blocked from all these people. Yeah. Absolutely fucking sad. That's what's crazy to me is that people uh, think that. Like they think the weirdest things are the reason you're successful, right? Like they'll like copy something and it's annoying that they're copying the same building or something, right? Or a certain piece. And it's just like, that's not what it like. One of my favorite quotes a buddy told me, he's like, uh, you know, if they're copying you, they're always going to be one step behind. Right. So knowing that I always like felt a little bit better about like people. Yeah. If they're just waiting for my next move, then like, great. They'll never innovate, you know, faster than me, but it just also keeps you, keeps you, yeah. you know thinking and, and puts pressure on you to continue to innovate well that's i mean mark he used to say every time someone used to copy us we used to use either debt that piece or move on to something else either the style of marketing or you know that piece in general but yeah. we, we even the style of you know even shooting in our building probably we 
we won't even do that anymore. We'll probably yeah. debt that. Favorite book? Hit me with it. Uh, Give me one, one or two. I mean, hard things about hard things. That it's been a while since I've since I've read that, but that was for founders who early stage, 10, 15 employees. I think that's just like. Have you guys read that? I have not. Hard things about hard things. No. Oh my god, dude! I feel like that's your book. I got an arsenal. Dude, I think that's fucking books. I think that. that's both your guys' books. Uh, I don't read, so no. I listen to the, and honestly, listen to the uh, the audio book. That's what I do too. But this is like uh, uh, um, Ben Horowitz, uh, basically founder of I think Netscape. And is this then, Horowitz Andreessen? Yeah. So yeah. so so Mark Andreessen and then Ben Horowitz. I believe they co-founded this company together, but it's Ben Horowitz who's speaking about it. Sold like I don't know. They sold it for like 1.6 billion or something. But he's like talk. He loves to cuss, and he's talking about like people are getting emotional about cussing in the office. So he has to figure out a way of like, you know, what, what's right and what's wrong. And it's just all these different. Isn't that it? Right? No, that's not it right there. Sorry, I thought that was it. It looks like the same color scheme. Anyways, I feel like it's just like it's, it's just the whole story, and then and then it's it a whole story. Back yeah, and he's also like he's you know he likes he, he he's really into like rap and like you know he's like cultured. So it's just he talks about some really interesting stuff, but it's. He's a smart guy, obviously a multi-billionaire, and he just talks about like the hard things about hard things. Like, what are the hard things about growing a business that like they don't teach you in business school or business classes that you're just gonna have to figure out? He talks about you know just having days where he was just like you know emotional and depressed and crying, and then days where like empl- like issues with employees, and it's just it just hits home on a lot of things that. Um, that does sound like I need you that. Got, you, I've never you know, read it, but I feel like I, I might. It's like one of the. I'm it. surprised. It's like one of the top business like books I, it, I it kind of it reminds me of like a, a contextual attraction no jeff you don't read business books it's any business story book you ever read the mark echo book on label no i didn't but that's I the same type of vibe you should definitely yeah. fucking read it. everyone highly recommend that mark echo on label book let's talk about the piece flip around why'd you pick this piece this is unreleased piece are we launching this soon we should probably launch it soon. yeah yep there you go so this is with uh international space archives and nasa and why'd you pick it I think I just have an affinity towards space too, but obviously dreams rise, fears fall, man. I mean, that's, it just hits home. I feel like you got to dream big. Um, although I will say that fears for me always, the, not the fear of not being successful or the fear of not, you know, achieving doing my dream. Fear of not doing. Yeah, the fear of not doing it. Like I'm more scared of like, you know, like having, like there's this Bill Burr quote about like, like, uh, I, can't, I can't should know what it is, but it's basically like, it, um, like the nightmare scenario is like you know, uh, li- li- being content, living in a, a home with a wife you don't love and a house you don't want, with you know, like yeah. having having a, a you know that type of lifestyle versus just going after your dreams and failing is a much like that. That's that's exciting. That's a, that's a purpose, right? So, and I always resonated with that. Like I couldn't see. Even today, like, yeah, I sold movement, but it's just like, I'm still like thinking about like, not even business, but just like, what's the purpose of life? What do you like being fulfilled, you know, happy? Like, what are those things? And if you find something that you want to, whether you want to be successful or whatever it is you want to do, it's like, you know, just going after that is to me is, I don't know, it's worth living. So last question for you. Did you ever think you were going to solve for that number? Because I'm always, I feel like there's, it just, for me, the number just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. What's the situation with you? Did you ever think that? I, I mean, I think we, you know, we were doing significant amount of revenue, obviously. And um, I think we were doing like somewhere around 70-ish, 75 when we got sold. Um, and I don't know, you read headlines of other businesses selling for multi, you know, hundreds of millions or billions or whatever. So, yeah, I mean, I think when we started, no, I don't think there was like a thought on my mind. Like, I, like getting to a million dollars was like the celebration. And then we did $7 million and that was like, holy shit, that's the most money. I don't know anyone who's making $7 million. And then the next year we did 30 and we were like, okay, this is insane, right? So it's always a moving target, I think of what, but but also what I've learned, like being now around people who have sold their companies and now selling a company. Um, I mean, like if you're gonna sell a company, there, you can't have an expectation, regardless of how much revenue you're doing, there has to be a potential acquire right so you can't just be like oh i want to sell for this amount if there's no acquire that's in your space right i mean now there's different ways of you know going about it there's private equity there's you know public markets there's all there's different scenarios within that that i wasn't necessarily educated on until you know until we started to do significant amount of revenue and i started to go and talk to founders who had sold um 
and talk to founders who have been through it before. That was, I'd say that the biggest piece of advice that I can give anyone is like, you know, uh, just network with people, you know, like-minded people. If you're in, if you're in the thick of the business where you need help on Facebook or whatever, you know, most of the time the founders aren't going to necessarily be able to help you with like the inner workings of Facebook network with go take the person who's running media, you know, out to coffee or to a drink or, or whatever it is, like try and network with those people. Um, but if you're thinking about just like, okay, how do I navigate bigger issues as a founder, go and talk to people who recently, I think more recently than like someone who did it, you know, even like 10 years ago, it's always uh, changing for sure. is yeah. Cause like we had talked to, you know, I mean, people in our space that had done it 10, 20 years ago or, successful founders who, who had exited 10 years ago even and it's like they didn't do it through facebook and instagram and they didn't you know they don't it's just a different world today and it will be a different world in five years from now like i even you know even when people ask me about crowdfunding i tell them like that you was know, seven you, years ago man. Like, it now, yeah, yeah it's like like go t go look at a, pro, a you know a campaign that worked within the last 12 to 48 months or 12 to 24 months and and like you know think about it that way so Speaking of which, when we uh, we needed an intro, we're, we're testing new channels, and I reached out to your guy and he introduced us. So there's a perfect example. Dope. So uh, why don't you tell everybody where they can find you, your personal Instagram, LinkedIn, all of it? Yeah, uh, Instagram's probably the easiest. Uh, Jake, J K E Kassen, K S S A N, or uh, my website, jakekassen.com. Any last words for the camera? Anything? Advice? Something that's coming down the pipeline? Anything? Dreams rise, fears fall. Let's go. Coming soon. <laughs> oh. Thank you, man. Done.